So welcome. It's great to see what a, what a, a wonderful crowd here. Jambo, Karibu. Now you know how to speak Swahili. Um, I'm sure you know a little bit more Swahili too, like the word safari is a Swahili word for a journey. And you might know Simba if you watched old uh, like Tarzan movies or maybe even The Lion King. So Simba is lion. So now you've got four words in Swahili. So <laughs> sign up for the next trip. So here's, here's Tanzania, a uh, map of Africa. Tanzania is the one in green. And you can see it's just slightly lower, slightly south of the equator. It's about two and a half degrees south, which is roughly 150 miles south. So the sun really goes right straight overhead. Um, and we were there in October, just slightly after the autumnal equinox. So this, the sun really was very high in the sky. Now, the interesting thing about that, we're at 40 some odd degrees north. So when we watch the sun, it goes in the south and comes down kind of at an angle. But in Tanzania, because it goes straight up, it comes straight down. So it gets light very quickly and it gets dark very quickly. Very, very different feeling. You look at the sun, it's you know, a little bit above the horizon and you say, well, you know, we've got an hour of sunlight and it's gone. Um, so here's a, a better map of Tanzania and there's some wonderful places in Tanzania. Well, we landed in Arusha, which is, oh, let me, I can use this thing, yeah. Here's um, Arusha. Kilimanjaro Airport, and uh, that's Kilimanjaro right there, and up here, I don't know if you could, can you read that from back there? It might be a little bit hazy. Anyway, up here is the Serengeti, the Nagoro, Nagoro Crater, uh, Lake Manyara, where we went in Tarangiri. These are places that I'll be talking about during the, the talk. Um, over here is Gombe Stream. That's where uh, Dr. Jane Goodall did all her work with the chimpanzees back in the 60s. So. I'd love to go there sometime, but I understand now you can't get near the chimpanzees because they're worried about communicating uh, different diseases. And we all know about Zanzibar. Everybody, for some reason, knows about Zanzibar. It's a tiny little island. But how many people, let's get this thing to work, how many people remember a country called Tanganyika? People that are as old as I am, I remember that. Okay. Well, in 1964, Tan Ganyika merged with Zanzibar and made Tanzania. So that's how they, that came about. Um, Dar es Salaam used to be the capital, but the capital has moved to Dodoma. Here's the camera equipment I took. Um, the two cameras on the right are mine, uh, the Nikon D800 and the D300. I had the D300 converted to infrared, so it takes a different kind of photograph, and you'll see that a little further on. Uh, to have a backup camera, I rented this, the D700. I wanted to have another D800 because it would be the same and make it easy to, to uh, transfer back and forth, but I couldn't get one, so I settled for the 700, and I rented this long lens. This, was, this zooms up to 500 millimeters, if anybody knows what that means. So to get the best of both worlds, I put the long lens on my camera, because my camera has a larger sensor than the 700. So now I could zoom in as far as possible and still get the biggest uh, uh, image out of that. And I put the, my smaller lens on this camera. And in Tanzania, it's very dusty, so you don't want to take lenses off cameras and switch them around because dust gets into the camera. So I tried to avoid that, and basically I didn't change the lens uh, for two weeks. This was our transportation, Toyota Land Cruiser, a heck of a vehicle. Um, I was really impressed with what this thing went over and through. <laughs> it uh, really takes a beating. Um, it's a 10-person vehicle. We had the four people, my wife and I, and our friends Kathy and George who are here, and, um, and the driver. So it was not packed, and we had enough room that when we saw something really good, we could all get up here and be safe, you know, and still be able to see the different animals or whatever we were looking at. And it had this little pop-up top, which is very handy, kept us out of the sun, which is probably the best part about it. And we had a couple of sprinkles a day or two, not much, and of course it kept us out of the rain, but the important part was out of the sun because the sun is beastly there. Um, 
you might see right here is a snorkel. This vehicle is made to go through rivers. We didn't go anything, through anything deeper than that, and I'm happy about that. Because as we were driving around, now this vehicle's a little bit old, it's been beaten up, dust was coming in from everywhere. So if dust is going to come in, water's going to come in. So, but anyway, um, that's the snorkel. That's where it does its breathing up there. And that's George making believe he's taking a picture, by the way. Here's one of the Land Cruisers in action. This is in uh, Tarangiri. So I, I don't want to look like I'm showing you vacation pictures by showing you the hotels where we were, but I thought the architecture and the furnishings were very interesting. So I'm going to show you a few of them. This is Aru Meru Lodge. That's a name that's combined from Arusha, which is the, the city, and Mount Meru, which is the mountain that's, that's nearby. Mount Meru is almost 15,000 feet high. So um, Mount Whitney in California, that's the highest in the lower 48, that's 14,494, just to give you an idea. All right, so inter interesting place, and here's inside. Uh, they just have a different way of doing that. And in the back was the dining area, and even outside was more dining era, area under a, a, a roof. And most of the time, the doors are wide open. So quite often, you get birds coming in. It's, it's kind of like being in Home Depot. <laughs> <laughs> the grounds were, were pretty lush. Um, this place was, was enclosed to keep the wild animals out and to keep the tourists in. Um, so the, it, the, irrigated it, they had nice plantings. Um, if this had been open to the animals, everything would have been eaten. And we didn't know that when we were there. Uh, then when we went to another place, it was really barren because it was open to the animals. So here's a bird of paradise. Um, oh, this is Kathy. This is about 10 minutes after she, was that me? Okay, <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> I've got two mics, I don't know what to do. Um, this is Kathy about 10 minutes after she took that pill that makes you small. <laughs> this is an, an agave. We make tequila out of agave. And um, I don't know if this kind is good for making tequila, but it's worth a try. And here's a dick dick. These, there were several dick dicks living on the grounds. As I say, it was enclosed, so they were pretty safe. Uh, dick dick is the smallest antelope in the world. They're only about 12 or 14 feet of feet. Yeah, that's the biggest <laughs> antelope in the world. <laughs> they're about 12 to 14 inches high at the shoulder. So they're really, really tiny. And uh, they get that name because that's the sound they make when they're warning the other dick dicks that there's something like a predator around. So they make that. I, I've never heard one, so I can't imitate it, but that's how they got their name. Uh, now, the, there were no rooms in the main lodge, but each we all stayed in, in bungalows, separate bungalows, and there were duplexes. Kathy and George had one side, and Sue and I had the other. And um, I was interested to see that the pathways are kind of raised. They're up about this far, which makes me think that in the rainy weather, they become like bridges. So, now, fortunately, we were there at the end of the dry season, which uh, we chose that carefully um, for different reasons. Uh, but, so, but we were starting to get into the wet season, you could see clouds. Uh, the friend, uh, Billy, the guy that arranged our trip, was surprised at how many clouds showed up in our photos. Because when he goes there, like in the drier season, doesn't get any clouds. This is inside. Um, every place that we stayed, except when we were in the tent and in at the top of the, the uh, Nagoro Nagoro crater, had mosquito nets. Now, I don't know if they really helped. If it was just to make people feel good, it was like style. But we were happy to have it, and we, <laughs> we pulled everything shut. Um, and most of the uh, buildings there are not wooden the way we would do here. They're masonry because they're in a, a tropical climate. And you've got a lot of animals and bugs, you know, termites, uh, carpenter ants, whatever, that eat the wood. So uh, they use um, masonry and concrete. So because of that, they have a lot of curves in the walls. Okay, they've made round buildings, and you can see here that it's round. And even inside the, the, uh, the, the bathroom, um, the shower stall was curved. Very interesting. You never see that around here. 
And that's a jacaranda. We saw beautiful jacarandas. Um, I had a hard time getting good pictures of them because usually when I saw the good ones, <laughs> we were going by at 60 miles an hour. Um, so this is one, lovely, lovely purple flowers. We would see lines of them, which was really nice. So this, we're still in Arusha now, um, and I think that's the end of Arusha. Yes, we're on our way out. That's Mount Maru. Now Mount Maru is, um, as I said, about 15,000 feet high, and um, Arusha is somewhere around 5,000 feet. So it's only, only 10, it's only two miles up from there. Now, Kilimanjaro is on the other side, so we, we couldn't see Kilimanjaro most of the time. Kilimanjaro is 19,400, I think, uh, which is just a wonderful mountain. I think it's the, tall, yeah, it's the tallest mountain in Africa. Um, almost anybody can climb it, they say. It's very easy to climb, but it takes a week to do it because you have to get used to the altitude. So they really pace you slowly. Um, and you come down in, I think, one day. This is a fig tree. At least our, our guide told us it was a fig tree. It looked more like a banyan tree to me. But what he may have been saying, and I didn't get this cleared up, it may have been what we call a strangler fig. In the Everglades, we have strangler figs. It, it grows kind of like a vine. It doesn't have enough strength to it, itself to get up into the canopy. So it winds around trees. And it, some will go this way, some will go that way. And over time, they get stronger and stronger and they actually strangle whatever tree they're climbing on. And then over the years, that tree dies and it starts to decay. By the time it decays, the strangler fig is really heavy and can stand up by itself. Now the next photo, this is with a, the infrared camera. So you see the, the foliage looks kind of white because the foliage reflects the infrared light differently than the visible light. Here's another shot with infrared. <laughs> so, <laughs> those are sunglasses. Okay, they don't look like they look like Aristotle and NASA's glasses or something. But um, those are sunglasses. And the thing is, the infrared goes through those lenses. The lenses that we use, they block out the visible light. Certainly, makes things dark. And a lot of you know good lenses will block out the ultraviolet which is a very short wavelength, but the infrared is a long wavelength and gets through. Now, another thing, the infrared makes, makes um, foliage look whitish, but it also, anything that you have is, is synthetic comes out white looking. So I think Sue's jacket is like a cranberry, as I recall. So it comes out looking very white. And apparently, Kathy was wearing cotton pants, so they don't look that white. Now we're in Arusha, well that was Arusha National Park too. This is Arusha National Park. We saw a number of guinea fowl there and I was kind of waiting to get a better shot and like we didn't see any after that so I kind of had a missed. But um, they're pretty little birds and there were tons of baboons in uh, Arusha National Park. There's a little family just on the road. And here's a mama taking really good care of her baby getting groomed by one of the younger members. Uh, and if you notice, the, the babies have pink skin. This is true with chimpanzees also. The, the babies are born, born with the pink skin. As they get older, their skin gets darker and darker and darker. And then you'll see the adult, like, like the, um, the mother there, has the, the dark face. There's mama taking good care. And there's the baby riding on the back. Now, human babies have that grasp response, if you remember. You can, if the baby, you've touched the baby's fingers, it'll, it'll grab onto your fingers. You can quite often pull a baby up that way. And I, I suspect that's just a, ha oh, I can't say a hangover. <laughs> it's, a, it's a holdover from when we were more like apes and you, know, you had to hang on to go where you're supposed to go. And uh, apes, monkeys, gorillas, um, their pelvises are shaped differently than ours, so they can't really stand up straight. So that's why. You see the, them walking like this. Baboons will mostly go on, on all fours. They're very happy doing that. They can almost like gallop. Uh, but when they have to go on, on two feet to carry something in their hands, they have a harder time. Here's a, a mature male, rather robust. Uh, he looks like somebody you don't want to mess with. 
So, and we didn't. Oh, incidentally, um, we were never concerned about any of the animals coming into the vehicle. They just won't come in. In fact, most of them ignore you. Unless you do something, they kind of look to see what's going on. But we were told that when we stopped, if we got out of the vehicle, we had to lock everything up because the baboons would go in and they would tear it to pieces looking for food. Okay, but if you're in there, not a problem. Here's a younger male. You can see he's not quite as robust and he still wouldn't mess with him because he has formidable teeth. Now he wasn't being mean, he was yawning. But, you know, he's kind of bored, like, what are these guys doing here? Um, so he's yawning. I thought, well, it's a good, sh good chance to get um, a shot of the fangs. And then the flamingos. We were fortunate. This was the only place we saw flamingos, as I recall, at least up close. Um, and we hardly ever see flamingos flying. I think most of the flamingos that are kept, like, at Hialeah Racetrack or whatever, I think their flight feathers are clipped so they won't fly away. It was nice to see them fly. And it's interesting that they have the black on the wings. You don't see that when their wings are folded up. Here's a real group of them. Kind of makes me think of like a, a home and garden center in, you know, in Florida. You know, the always flamingos out. Um, pretty interesting. And flamingos get their color from the food that they eat. Okay, so it's not a natural color for them, but it's from the food. I don't know. I hope I don't eat that stuff someday and I turn pink. <laughs> Here's a better look at the flamingos. Now, when a flamingo eats, um, they don't just pick at something in the water. They actually have their beak upside down. That's why it's shaped that way. So it's kind of upside down and they go like this and they sort of filter feed. Very interesting way of, of eating. They have a very, very strong tongue for doing that. And this was a great shot. <laughs> The uh, three-headed flamingos are usually only found nowadays in zoos and traveling shows. <laughs> There's one flying. If it weren't for that stupid nose, they'd be a beautiful bird. <laughs> now here's a zebra acting like any other horse or maybe a dog, rolling in the dust, having a great time. It, it's, you know, it's a good way to scratch the back, and as I understand, it also keeps the bugs off them. Okay. Now we're on our way to the crater. Here's a typical Maasai village. Now the, the buildings that we saw, any of the villages we saw, were almost identical. We have the, these round huts, and I think it's what they call mud and wattle. They use little sticks and weave it together and then plaster it with mud. Kind of like lath and plaster, only a different way. Um, and then the thatch roof. But the Mas Maasai village that we visited was different, and you'll see that. And I, which makes me wonder if it was kind of like, like just a touristy setup, but we'll see. So on the way, more agave. I didn't see anybody making tequila, but whatever. And agaves are called century plants. It, they don't take a whole century, really, to bloom. but Later in life, they do shoot up this, this stalk with flowers on it, and then they die. So you can see how dusty it was uh, toward the end of the rainy season. It's, uh, these are some Maasai people. You can pick them out. They always have the, the it's like a robe. It's called a, a shuka, um, typically in blue or red, maybe striped, maybe plaid kind of, but um, almost always the same. Uh, so they're taking their goats either to get some water or feed or bringing them back. And here's some more. And this appears to be a riverbed. Um, we're at the end of the dry season. The river has apparently dried up. But just from the way the, the color of the dirt is and the way it, it goes around um, these little hills, it makes me think that's probably just a dried up riverbed. Our first baobab tree. Now, it's hard for me to say baobab because I grew up learning baobab, but it apparently is baobab. Very interesting tree. Um, you can tell just from looking at it, it's not like a normal tree that we see. Um, now, those, uh, the trunk can be like 10 or 15 feet wide, and quite often it's hollow inside. 
Um, nature show, um, remember when uh, George Page used to do nature? I guess it was back in the 70s, maybe even 80s. Uh, he, he did a whole one hour show just on the tree. How the tree lives, the animals that live in it, the animals that eat it. So ever since then I've wanted to see one. Okay, there it was. While we were sitting there uh, looking at this tree, there's a little kid tending his goats on the other side, side of the tree. And he saw us, he came running, okay. Yeah. He figured we were gonna give him water or candy or something good, and um, you're not supposed to do that because they don't have oral hygiene the way we do. If you give them candy, they're not going to brush their teeth. It's really bad for them. Plus, it, it gets them into the habit of begging uh, from the tourists. But he came running, and I can guarantee that that's all he was wearing, was that shuka and his sandals, okay? Um, I left those pictures out just for Modesty for the little kid. He's just very intent on getting up there. He wants his little piece of candy. And our guide actually yelled at him. I don't know what he said because it was all Swahili, and I only know five or six words in Swahili. So, um, but uh, I think we did give him a little something and then sent him on his way. Here's the Nagoro Nagoro Crater. That's another place I'd wanted to go to for, since I watched George Page on Nature. It's uh, 12 miles across. It is a caldera. It's called the Nagoro Nagoro Crater. It's a caldera. What's the difference between a caldera and a crater? Anybody know? Okay, yes, <laughs> Jim does, okay. Um, a, a caldera is a crater that fell in. When it, was, it was empty inside and all the rocks fell in. Now, um, Oregon, uh, in Oregon, the Crater Lake is a caldera that has a crater inside. That little island in the middle is a, is a crater. It's, I think it's called Wizard Island. So that's the difference. You go home and quiz people on that later. Uh, our, the place where we were staying was on the ridge over here, kind of a little bit past where that, that uh, lake is. And that, that came in to be important later on, and you'll see. Uh, I'm, are you having trouble with this mic? It seems to get louder as I go like that. OK, it's all right? OK. Um, so it, a marvelous, almost like a, a, a microcosm, because a lot of the animals, especially like the elephants, they look at this thousand foot cliff and say, I'm doing okay here, <laughs> you know, I think I'll stay here, you know. Uh, so the elephants don't travel back and forth very much. Uh, some of the other the smaller animals do. Here's like the only shot I have, well, not the only, but this was the lodge on the rim of the crater. And we're, I can't say like prisoners there, but there was no place to go to get out of the hotel. You know, there, the, we had this balcony and like, okay, you could jump off the balcony, I suppose. Um, and there are signs saying, you know, don't go past here anyway. So we didn't, um, you're, you're in Africa, okay? <laughs> There's a lot of stuff that lives around there. So we were kind of isolated in that, that little hotel. Anyway, so that's the view and I wanted to show you that because the next morning, this is what the, that little lake looked like. And this is even later in the day when I, when I woke up, I was still jet lagged. It looked like, like a, a mist on the little lake that was like phosphorescent. It was just the weirdest thing. And as time went on, I could see it better and better and more like this. And then what I, I found out later is that the crater, it sort of makes its own climate. And there was this circular cloud hanging over the crater. So when the sun came up, it would kind of peek under that. Now, when I was looking at this, I couldn't see the sun any place. All I could see was light on the lake, so it was, it was kind of confusing. So here's the way it looks when the sun comes up a little higher. This is a marvelous kind of a place. And this happened the two mornings I got up early enough to notice it. So. Here we are going down into the crater. Here's the, the high-tech ticket booth. There are, there are three roads that go up and down uh, the crater, one to go in and two to come out. So that's how they limit the access, which is really nice because then the animals are pretty much safe from, from poachers down there. As we're descending, here's a, um, an acacia tree and it's got these little nests hanging off it. They're from weaver birds. 
Now, weaver birds make a suspended nest, kind of like how Orioles do. Um, as a matter of fact, here's a weaver. There are several kinds of weavers. And what I found interesting was that Orioles are black and orange. Different than this bird is black and orange, but it's funny that they have black and orange and they both make these, these woven uh, suspended nests. Lilac breasted roller, pretty little bird. We saw a few of them there. This was the, the photo that I liked the best. He kind of he sat there and you know, waited for us to take the picture. He was very nice to us. Warthogs, um, kind of ugly little things. But I'll tell you what, the, the babies are really cute. The little piglets are <laughs> really, really cute. Um, it, these guys are pretty tough. They, their tusks rub against each other as they chew. So they're always sharpened, so very, very sharp tusks. And they can do a lot of damage with those. One afternoon, I was in the tent. I was having a nap after lunch. And um, something caught my attention. I sat up. and. There were two warthogs like four feet from me, so, um, and they looked at me and went, ah, <laughs> and off they went. So I was like, whew, that's good. Uh, so. And the wildebeest. These guys are all over the place. There are thousands upon thousands of them. Um, we also call them Nu, and our, our guide pronounced it Gnu, which he may be right. But then again, he called them wild beasts. So whatever. I, I think wildebeest is probably uh, Dutch or Afrikaans, uh, just which means wild beast. Semi-educated guess. And they, they're called the, the bearded wildebeest. And here's, here's why. You can see the kind of the beard hanging off this one here. It's a, kind of a strange kind of beard, but uh, it's supposed to be off your chin, I thought, but this comes off his neck. A little image show how many there. I mean, you can't put in a picture how many wildebeest you see. Here's one. This is a, an infrared photo of wildebeest. I like infrared because this, the sky really pops. I love the way the clouds look in infrared. And then the zebras. Our guide was telling us that the zebras are the eyes of the, of the wildebeests. They have better vision. So when they're migrating, a lot of times the wildebeest will follow the zebras. In addition to having better eyes, they have better brains. Because when they get to a river where the crocodiles are, the zebras say, OK, you guys go first. <laughs> so, so, so the wildebeest says, oh, sure, no problem. <laughs> so the crocodiles get them. Crocodiles get full. And the zebras say, looks like it's OK now. <laughs> Off they go. So, now, for the photographers in the group, I just, oh, even not photographers, a lot of people think it's wrong when you modify an image from what the camera just saw. And that's not really a good attitude to have because the camera doesn't see the way the human eye sees. And you almost always have to change it somehow. Now, if you look at the, the backs of these zebras, I'm pointing at the screen instead of pointing up here, like the backs of the zebras, see how that's, it's, the sun is glistening off there. Well, when I change it to a sepia, because I like working in sepia, watch what happens to the back. So now you can see the animal again, <gasps> instead of seeing that reflection. I really like zebras. Here's just a side shot, just to, to show the, the stripes. Um, they're really great animals. They sound like donkeys. They're, I think they're closer, more closely related to donkeys than they are to, uh, to uh, horses. But they all are, are all equids. And here's one of the brown stripes. I thought they're supposed to have black and white stripes. Anybody, any horse people in here? Anybody ride or spend a lot of time with horses? Anybody have any idea why this has brown stripes? I agree. <laughs> Good guess. Good. It's young. By the time they reach 12 or 18 months, their stripes go black. But a young one, now, here's the giveaway. That's why I asked about horse people. See the tail? That's the tail of a foal. It's a young one. Secretary bird. A lot of quizzes tonight. Um, anybody know why it's called a secretary bird? In the old days, now the only time we have secretaries 
it's like, you know, Secretary of the Treasury or somebody's on the board of directors or something like that. In the old days, people, bosses had secretaries who took dictation and did typing and stuff like that. And back then, women didn't have the clothes that they wear to business today. They didn't have good pockets and whatever, and they would have their hair up. So they would stick their pens and pencils in their hair. So the feathers coming off the back of this, the bird's head kind of look like, they don't really look like pencils, but uh, quill pens, okay, quill pens. Um, so that's how the secretary bird got its name. That's a big bird, that's about two feet high. And you could tell from the beak, it's it got the curved beak, so it's a meat eater. So the, the secretary bird, secretary bird will eat um, snakes, lizards, and I think it'll even go for little small furry things too. Thompson's gazelles, people call them Tommies for short, uh, beautiful little antelopes, antelopes uh, stand about two feet at the shoulder. Uh, here's one with the, the baby. Uh, and you can see the baby has more of a brownish stripe. As it gets older, the, the stripe on his side will get darker. Now, Tommy, Tommies or Thompson gazelles are a favorite food for cheetahs. Uh, now the cheetahs run very fast, so do the Thompson gazelles. Sometimes they win, sometimes they lose. Here's our first lioness. Shortly before this, we had stopped at a comfort station and we we're standing around talking to some Maasai boys and um, just you know, enjoying the sunshine, whatever. We got in the car and we drove 200 feet. <laughs> I don't know, there's this lioness. Like, uh, you know. I don't know what the rules are, how these people get away with just like walking around, the lions don't eat them. So anyway, we see the lioness coming down toward the, the, uh, the road, and the guide said, oh, I'll cut her off. I was like, no, 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 you know, don't get her angry. But um, yeah, lions said, oh, there's a vehicle in my way, I'll go this way, not, not a big deal. Um, the, the vehicles don't threaten the animals, there aren't hunters, and their, the vehicles are not good to eat. So the animals don't have much interest in the vehicles. They just look at it as being like another rock that happens to move down the road. That was, our, that was a big, big day for us seeing the first lioness. And this is um, infrared. This is, again, in the crater where we had our lunch stop. The infrared sensor that I have in my camera sees a little bit of visible light. It's not only infrared. So I'm able to take those images and with a lot of work, make a, a color image out of it. And I, I think the, the way the colors come out is kind of striking. Here's a little bird. <laughs> I don't know what kind of bird it is. If I hadn't put little bird there, somebody would say, what kind of bird is that? <laughs> um, it's a little bird. I just thought it was a cute little bird. Hippos. These, there are quite a few hippos in there, and these hippos are really lucky. We didn't realize at that time, in fact, they probably don't realize how lucky they were. I'll show you some hippos later who are not lucky. So these guys were out there just having a wonderful time. Water looks just beautiful. Here are two of them. Now, they put their head in the water most of the time. Oh, need a breath, come up, take a breath, look around, nothing there. Pfft back down they go. So it looks like it's one hippo with two backs. A superb starling. These are beautiful little birds. They were all over. Now that's not a value judgment on my part. That's the name of the bird. It's called the superb starling. Uh, very pretty little thing. I can never get them out in the sun to really get the, the sun bouncing off the feather. So uh, we have to deal with it in the shade, partial shade. And the black kite. You can tell from the beak again, this is a, a meat eater. And look how big those wings are. They come like in front of that bird's chest. Marvelous wings. We were told not to go out of the vehicle with any food in our hands. Because it wouldn't be in our hands very long. So, and, and Billy, the guy that arranged our trip, um, I was told that he was standing outside the vehicle, but he was between the two doors. Had, Back door open, front door open, he was between the two doors, and this kite came by, snapped the whatever he was eating out of his hand, and ended up cutting his, his hand in the process. So 
we stayed in the vehicle when we were having our lunch. And they're really good flyers. You can see how he has one wing kind of tipped in and the other wing out. He's making some kind of a, a strategic turn here. And then here's one coming in for a strafing run. He probably saw a sandwich someplace he's going to get. <laughs> and the female ostrich. Now, if anybody uses a feather duster, or you remember your grandmother using a feather duster, it's probably female ostrich feathers. They're very soft, they're beautiful. They, they're not a pretty color, really, but they're just, just lovely, I think. So we saw the female ostrich, and then somebody said, oh, there's a male. And the male had already seen the female, and he was happy to see her. Look at his neck, it's red. He's happy to see her. And he's making this booming sound. He's calling to her. That's why his neck is kind of filled out like that. So there she is, she says, oh, Romeo. Okay, so she's coming up with some little posture there to say, you look pretty good to me. So he says, oh, that's wonderful. Now he. He, gets, he starts moving his head back and forth, side to side, very dramatic. He gets down on the ground, starts doing this on the ground kind of dance. That, so he's heading this way. Here's the other side. Now his head is facing away. Now you can see this is the underside of his wing, and that's his leg. You know, don't have feathers on that part. Kind of strange. But okay, so he's just really happy to see her, and he's making all these things. There he goes, back and forth, getting a little closer now. And she says, okay, honey, you know, um, come see me, give me a little kiss. So he's, he's going up there and he's, she gets down, he comes over, he keeps doing this, doing this stuff, and then he said, uh, I don't like you. So <laughs> that was it, that was this big build, but you see his neck is still red, he's, he's, he's still happy. And, um, and that was, that was the end of that, you know. Uh, yeah, okay, so here's a crowned crane. They're, they're, they're a big bird, too. They're probably about, uh, about like that. And um, they have these funny little puffy feathers on the tops of their heads. They're kind of pretty. That's how they got the name crowned crane. But anybody with long hair that's driven in the back of a convertible, let's say, knows that doesn't work well. So here's what a crowned crane looks like when it flies. It's all, <laughs> all gets swooped right back. But uh, pretty bird, look at the underside of the wing, and here's, here's a shot of the, uh, the top of the wing. Very, very pretty, very mar uh, remarkable bird. Camels. They, um, some of the people had imported camels because camels will do well in this kind of territory. Um, our guide said that the people weren't really using them well yet. They hadn't really learned all the little techniques, I guess, the way the Arabs have done with camels. But uh, it was kind of fun to see them. Now, this plant in the front, <clears throat> this is called oldapai. Oldapai is a, has, it has a lot of fiber in it. And when you take that fiber, you make a rope. It's called sisal, S-I-S-A-L. You may have heard of sisal before. So they can use that for making rope or even some kind of fabrics. So it, it just grows wild there. Here was our first leopard. In fact, I think it was our only leopard. Do you see it? Yeah. Huh? Yeah. A little closer? <laughs> OK, a little closer. There you go. Our guide had eyes like an eagle. He, he saw things that we could not see. And how he did it, we don't know. Um, now, Sure, he was on the radio with other guides, and they probably knew that such and such a tree had a leopard in it. And he, whether he saw it from the road, I don't know. But he would say, oh, there's a leopard in the tree, and we, <laughs> I don't see a leopard. So, in fact, if I could go back, oops, that didn't work. Yeah, see that, see the two things hanging down? One's a, one's a branch, and one's his leg, or tail, I'm sorry. See that? So, it kind of makes it hard to see. And it, right in this one, he's kind of just straddling the, the um, branch. Now, leopards will take their prey up into a tree to keep it from other animals. It's much easier to um, defend the prey if you're up on a big branch than if you're just out in the field somewhere. Now, lions can climb trees. I didn't realize that, but they, they can climb trees. And we, in fact, we saw some lions in trees. 
Um, but certainly the hyenas can't climb trees and other animals that are scavengers can't climb trees. So it makes it pretty handy for the leopard to, to uh, keep the prey up in the, in the tree. <clears throat> I think leopards and tigers are the most beautiful of the large cats. They're just they're marvelous, marvelous animals. Our first herd of elephants, okay. Not a big herd, uh, but we were so excited to finally see a herd of elephants. There was one time later on in Tarangiri, we could see five herds at one time. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I think I'll have to get a little water. So. Um, Anyway, it was, it was just a pleasure to see them. They were coming our way, so we drove up a little closer on the road, and it came a little bit closer. Now, now here's a, this is a female. <clears throat> you can see uh, elephant's mammaries are in the, by the front legs. Um, same with all the primates, uh, manatees. And it seems that to me that the animals with soft feet have, have the mammaries toward the, the front, whereas animals with hooves like horses and cows and goats have the mammaries toward the back. Why? I don't know. Um, and this, this part here, it looks like the lip is actually the, the uh, ear from the other side. So you can get pretty close. In fact, Here's an idea how close you get. <laughs> right. Then, as I say, the animals, they don't really care about you. They know that you're not a threat and you're not good to eat. Um, I, I've heard stories, people have been watching uh, like a lioness. The lioness will come and lay down in the shade of the vehicle just because it's shady. So it's cool to get out of the sun. And there they go. Now, a, a cheetah, a lot of times, I've heard a lot of stories of this, a cheetah will hop up on the, on the hood of the vehicle to get a better look around. And, of course, the people in the vehicle are like, mm, you know, what are we going to do now? But they're not interested in you. Uh, they want to be able to see a little further. The Cape buffalo. Our guide told, his, told us that he is more afraid of Cape buffalo than any other animal in Africa. They're not friendly. Um, in fact, they have a bad attitude most of the time. Uh, they're big and strong. I saw a video with one buffalo against a lion. The lion attacked the buffalo. He got the buffalo with a horn and flipped this lion about 10 feet in the air. And the lion said, oh, okay, you win. <laughs> I'm out of here. Uh, you know, certainly a pride of lions will take down a buffalo. That's going to happen. But one-on-one, -on -one, uh, the buffalo stands a very, very good chance. These guys were smelling something. We don't know what it was. It wasn't us. <laughs> I'm sure it wasn't us. Anyway, they're, they're not looking our way. They're looking off in a different direction, but you can see they're all kind of sniffing. And we, we don't know what it was, but something caught their attention. Now here's a buffalo with the oxpeckers. Oxpeckers, um, little birds, will go on the hair or skin of the larger mammals, and they'll pick like ticks and other biting insects, whatever. So it helps the animal, the, like the buffalo or the giraffe or whatever, because you get rid of these horrible insects and the birds get a, a meal. So it works out pretty nicely. They'll crawl all around. So you see this guy's right on the lip and the nose here. He comes up his face, the other one's up on the top. Now these one's up on the top, the other one's coming down by the ear. So uh, the animals seem to enjoy it, or at least they, they don't pay much attention to it. Here's an impala. There's, these are nice looking animals. We didn't see too many impala. And one thing I did notice was it doesn't look like the impala on a Chevy. <laughs> if you look at the horns, the impala horns on a Chevy, they just kind of go back like, a, like an ibex or something. Uh, but these are kind of a twisty horn. Um, so here's, this guy was either itching for a fight or just wanted to, you know, work some, something off, I don't know what. He's having a little jousting match with a bush. And here he is, and something had caught his attention off in the distance. And well, these, these two here, uh, these are young ones. These are not females. The females are a little bit smaller than the males, uh, but these are too small. These are just young ones. So something caught his attention, and he went off. Look at the posture in this guy. The tail is up, the, the whole different way he has the, his head and everything. Uh, and he went off, we didn't see where he went. 
So uh, could have been a, a rival, or it could have been one of his wives went away and didn't like it. I don't know. And the heart of beast. I always feel sorry for the heart of beast. They look like they're from a Far Side comic. It's just, it's just something with the, the line across the eyes. It makes them not look very smart. So uh, we saw a few heart of beasts, and <laughs> I always laugh when I see them. There's a nice elephant. And I, I put this in because he has pierced ears, or she has. I don't know if it's a boy or a girl. I think it's a girl. So um, the holes in the ears, very interesting. And how that got, got there, I don't know. Here you are, a little bit closer. How close can you get? Pretty close. Wow. Yeah. And uh, I think it's time for a makeover. <laughs> uh, look at those, those eyelashes. I mean, <laughs> you've got to do something with those, those eyelashes, Mary. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to pick on Mary. There's a Mary in the audience, I know. I just picked the name out of the air. Um, so here's a, here's a calf that's nursing, and they're self-weaning. The mother doesn't have to do anything to wean the baby. The tusks grow, and after a while, the baby can't reach to nurse. Like, sorry, <laughs> you're stuck with grass. <laughs> sorry? Okay. Uh, this was an old male lion. Um, didn't seem to have a pride, or he lost his pride. Uh, photo boom. Uh, there was a, a dead zebra not far away. I left it out for, you know, you know making it a nice family show. Um, he was like huffing and puffing, and you could sort of see him saying, I can't believe I ate the whole thing. He was, he was so full, he just, he just couldn't move, and he just had that <sighs> kind of huffing and puffing. Um, so you can see the, the blood on his nose. He, he's been having a big meal. And you can, you can just tell from looking at him, he's not a young guy. So he, he probably got kicked out of his pride and has to go make do by himself. Just off to the distance a little bit, waiting for the lion to leave so they can get a meal, were some vultures and marabou storks. And what's interesting with this is that they all have their wings open. Because it's early morning, it was still chilly. So they open their wings to catch all of the sun, get a little bit warmth. Now the marabou storks, that's this, these are the, the storks, um, they have this big pouch that comes down. Our guide told us they put air in that for when they fly at high altitude. I don't know if that's true. Um, maybe it is. I don't know. I always thought it was like a crop where they could put food in store before they finish swallowing it. But here's one flying. So look at that, that crop. It kind of pulls it up. I'm not really sure what's going on there. That's a beautiful wingspan. And here's one coming in for a landing. He's got his landing gear down. He's going <laughs> to come in and try to get some breakfast. Now, we're, we got to the lodge on the Serengeti. Now, remember how lush that first place was? And we walked into this, and I thought, oh, this isn't very nice, you know. But it's open to the, to the animals. So the animals come in, they eat all this, you know, any kind of grass or planting you have there, it's going to be eaten, especially in the dry season. In fact, there's a, a leopard that comes to drink from the pool every night in the dry season. Okay. When you, now the, the units are like three, three uh, units to a building. If you want to go from there to the, this is the uh, restaurant. If you want to go from there to the restaurant, you have to get an escort. And an escort will come down and take you up there armed with a flashlight. People get killed here. I mean, there was, a, there was a kid that got killed by hyenas. There was another kid that got killed by a leopard. I mean, people, you're not supposed to do that. So they come down with a stupid flashlight. Like, I'm not sure I feel safe because you don't know what the rules are. And they wouldn't tell you why that was OK. Later on, one of them said, if you shine a light in their eyes, they run away. Like, Suppose your battery goes dead. I, mean, you know, I, I don't want to deal with this. So, we didn't have any problems. Now over here, that's a, a sets of fly trap. This blue and black trap. I'll show you a better picture one later. And uh, the, oh, up here, there was a little animal, a couple of little animals living in there called a rock hyrax. I have some better pictures of that later on. 
don't know if anybody's heard of a rock hyrax, but uh, I think I saw that on a different nature show with um, George Page. So that, this, is, this is the grounds. Here's what the little houses look like. Very interesting little houses. This is our unit, we, the Hobbit house. We, Sue and I had this, and uh, Kathy and George are up here. Um, and I, I did see baboons running around outside one day, just, okay, fine. But um, animals just don't bother you. Now, when I go hiking in the White Mountains, mountains or something like that, I know what the rules are. I know what animals to avoid, you know, what their behaviors are. I don't know the rules in Africa. And so it was really good to have one of those guides that had the flashlight. <laughs> Here's the pool where the leopard comes to drink. You see it's still just wide open. And looking off the balcony, which is a little bit past the pool, that's the Serengeti. Serengeti was a little bit more um, wooded in places than I expected. I just thought it was going to be a big, open, grassy plain, but there was a, a fair amount of uh, trees. The baobab tree, infrared photo. You see how the infrared makes things look so different. Ah, here's another one. To give you the, size, the shape is just marvelous. And here are some. These are zebras down. It might be hard to see. Yeah. I don't know if that's, my eyes aren't that good anyway. I can't tell you if it's in focus or not. Zebras drinking. Uh, zebras are very skittish. And remember I told you they let the wildebeest go across the river first. <laughs> now they're, they're kind of skittish. So they'd come down to drink and something would happen. They'd run away, off they would go. A couple of minutes would pass and they'd, let's go get another drink. And then they would do it all again. So. And, of course, we don't know what's going on in the, in the woods. Could be a, a smell that they get or whatever. Giraffes. You have to like giraffes. Giraffes are just a, a special animal. Their tongues are black, by the way. Okay? <laughs> whatever that's worth. They eat acacia. Acacia is their favorite food. And you saw the, the thorns. Look at the thorns. And they just go... I don't know how they do it. Um, a lot of animals like the acacia. So uh, I ate some acacia leaves and it just tasted like leaves to me. It wasn't like, it wasn't like it tasted like anything special. Uh, but I guess, you know, in the dry season, when you have a choice between dry grass and acacia leaves, acacia leaves look pretty good. There's an oxpecker. Even the baboons like acacia. How these guys get up there I don't know. And we did hear one making the, the baboon equivalent of ow, 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 ow. <laughs> so they, they don't always get away scot-free. And then I'll tell you what, if I could climb up, I wouldn't sit down. <laughs> I don't know how they do this. Here's a photo I really liked. Um, it's, it's not sharp enough to use. Uh, because this is with the infrared camera, but we have a, a baboon sitting on the, the termite mound here, and we have a stork up in this old dead tree, and um, if that had been nice and clear, I think it would be a, a very interest, interesting photo to print up, but uh, can't do much more with that. Here are the unlucky hippos. This looks like it is a, a riverbed that's drying up. Now, in the, in the crater, remember, it wasn't like a river going away, so it wasn't really flowing water, but it was really clear water. Now here they are, and it's just like mud. Look at this. And uh, I'm sure they have a lot of fights, like, I, I really don't want to be here anymore, you know, just, uh, I can't deal with this. So here's a little closer shot of that guy, the teeth. Hippos kill more people in Africa than lions. Very dangerous animal. I guess the buffalo is more dangerous because the guide was more afraid of the buffalo than the hippo. And this goes to show you that even ugly hippos can be cute when they're babies. A baby anything kind of looks cute for some reason, so that's not so bad. Here's an infrared shot, a different hippo pool, but I wanted to throw this in. This, this was a little bit better than the first one we saw. But they're kind of stuck. They get sunburn, so they, they have to stay in the water. Typically, 
we would have a game drive in the morning and a game drive in the afternoon because at midday with the hot sun, the animals like go in the shade, lay down, just cool it for a while. So we would get up before dawn, go out, try to get to a place just as the sun was coming up. Then we'd come back, have lunch, you know, take a nap, whatever, and then we'd have a, a late game drive until the sun came down. So we'd get some sunset shots and things like that. We were driving to wherever we were going, and we happened to notice this lioness, lioness, lying on the side of the road. And here's another thing for aspiring photographers, what we call the golden hour. The golden hour is the first hour of, of light in the daytime, the last hour of light in the evening. So this lion now, if you can memorize the spots on her belly, fine. Otherwise, you can just look at that broken tree. I'm pointing at the screen, you can't see. This broken tree here, just so you know that I didn't fake this. This next picture is like five minutes later. You see what a difference the lighting can make. It's marvelous what the lighting can do for you. So there's that same tree. She's a young one. You can see she still has her spots. Um, and she's got a very full belly. This pride had eaten uh, recently. So that's all we saw. And then later on we saw somebody laying further over. And then another one popped up. Yeah, looking at the sun, I kind of like that photo. And look at the size of this tongue. Jeez. Then another one decided to come over. We're really getting quite a group now. Came over, making nice, nice. And you know, even when the, the lions are being nice, they look mean with those big teeth. And another one. Now we have five of them, and then the boy. Now this is a young male. He doesn't have a very heavy mane yet, but um, you know how he got to be the ruler of this pride, I don't know, but uh, I guess he's a tough guy. Yeah. I wanted a shot with him looking right at me, and I finally got one. And then he came over, he's making nice to his, his ladies, and uh, we thought we were going to see a honeymoon scene here, but um, that, that didn't happen. I guess everybody's still too full from <laughs> whatever. So here are four of the lionesses sitting there, and the whole time we were there, there were zebras, and I think even like a couple of wildebeest running back and forth over by the trees, and they're sitting there like, you know, I really couldn't eat anything more. In fact, um, here they are kind of going over, there's a zebra here. These are the lionesses uh, going over, and the zebras are saying, I don't want to be breakfast. In fact, there they are, a couple more running by, and the lionesses are just going over, and they said, oh, that's enough for one morning. So <laughs> they just kind of laid down. That was the end of it. They just, they were full and didn't need anything more. Here's the tsetse trap. Blue and black, a tra oh, I was going to explain why I'm wearing this outrageous outfit. We've got to watch out for the microphones. Because the light color reflects the sun, so it's cooler. It's synthetic, so it doesn't get wet and get soggy. Um, and also, it's a light color. Because the sets of flies are attracted to the dark colors, the blues and the blacks, they say wear light colors. Now, you might think, oh, you know, he's trying to, trying to dress like he's in a Tarzan movie or something like that. But that's, that's not the case. This is what really makes sense. And the, these um, pants zip off at the, at the knee, so if it gets really hot, you can zip the bottom of the legs off and it worked out pretty well. We did get, I can't say attacked, we were bitten by some sets of flies, uh, but we didn't know what they were. So we weren't really concerned, it was just another book, you know. <laughs> but they're really fast, they're faster than the flies that we have here. You know, when I, when I smack a fly, you usually catch it. So a lot of times I didn't catch it, when I did, it didn't get hurt. It, the fly kind of looked like, that's the best you can do, you know? They're, they're little tough guys. So, um, yeah, so we had a hard, well, it was only like, like two times we had them at all. So anyway, there's a tetsa fly. Now what's interesting is, oh, there's one. Got this off the web. It's just a little brown fly, you know? I didn't think it was anything special because I didn't know any better. But here's what I find really curious. If the flies are attracted to dark colors, and especially black and blue. If I had black skin, why would I wear blue? 
I'd go with red all the time. Uh, so anyway, here, here's the Maasai village that we, we visited. I, I think this was kind of like a setup for tourists, quite frankly, because uh, most of the time the Maasai don't like you coming in. You know, that's their, I mean, how would you like somebody knocking on your door and say, hey, I'm a, I'm a tourist from Africa, I'd like to come in and see your house. I, you know, I'm sorry, pal. So um, this is kind of, so anyway, they even come out and they dance for us, and then there were the ladies, and they do some kind of little jumping up and down thing. Um, very nice. And then the men do this jumping exercise to kind of show their prowess. They, they take one little jump, and then they go way up and come down like with, with uh, straight legs, they really bang on the ground. So they one, boom, up and down. So a couple of them were doing that. And then George got into the act. <laughs> now, George runs marathons, he's a triathlete. If anybody's gonna show him, show these guys that white men can jump, it's gonna be George. So <laughs> I thought, George, you'll go ahead, and I'll take the photos. Here's the village. Now you see the, the way that the, the um, huts are made, it's, it's different. They bend the, the, these twigs, branches over, and then you put mud over the whole thing. It's not round with the thatched roof the way the other Maasai villages looked. There's a mother and child. And here's how you get into them. They have this little entrance, and you go and you kind of weave around, go in. And now we're inside. This was our personal guide, if you want to call him that. And we went in, he answered any questions we had about Maasai, how they live, what they do. They, you know, they, they're migratory a little bit, depending on where the water is and the feed and stuff like that. Um, and I don't think these people really follow the typical Maasai way of life. Uh, he was very well spoken. His English was almost flawless. Um, and the, the uh, other fellow, uh, Yasarian, uh, the chief's son, he, um, he showed us around a little bit too, and he, his English was, was great. So you don't get that kind of an education living in a little hut like this. Don't know how that happens. While we were sitting there, you, you can see Sue's knee over here. There's Sue's knee. We're sitting on this little platform, and she heard something. There's a baby asleep behind us on this little platform. Okay. Here's your Osarian. He has these weights on his, his earlobes, trying, to, trying to, to stretch his earlobes a little bit without really putting too much pressure all, all at one time. So he's the chief's son. And we were told not to bring, for instance, candy for the kids and stuff like that, of course, for the dental um, hygiene, but also because the little wrappers, they don't have the concept of having like a trash can. You know, they live in a mud hut, so they don't, the papers would just go all over the place and it would be a mess. So we were told to bring things like uh, paper and pencils that the kids can write on and you know, have like a little school and things. So we did that. And Oldapai Gorge. Now, have any, any of you heard of Oldapai Gorge or Oldavai Gorge? No? Okay. Um, Oldavai Gorge was a misspelling that got perpetrated or perpetuated uh, because people just kept copying it, but it should be Oldapai. Our, our guy that was there, the one that was giving a little talk, made us all promise that when we got back to the States, we would tell people, it's old of pie, not old of I. Okay, yes, I've done my bit. In the, I guess, 50s and 60s, Lewis and Mary Leakey, you may even know Richard Leakey, their son, did a lot of um, excavating there to look for fossils and remnants of uh, early hominids, uh, human precursors. Uh, and different animals. Um, so in this gorge, oh, there's the high-tech ticket office. Here's the gorge. So they were able to dig into the, into the hillside here and find a lot of fossils. Old Depay Gorge is part of what's called the Great Rift Valley in, um, in uh, eastern, northeastern Africa, where the one part, the Horn of Africa, is kind of pulling apart from the rest of Africa, so that kind of caves in, so you have this big rift, the tectonic plate shifts. Anyway, here's, here are some of the remnants they found. These were all extinct animals. It's a, it's a uh, this is an extinct rhinoceros here. This is an extinct giraffe, other things. They found um, Homo habilis, Fossils, Homo habilis is called, it's handyman. When handyman, he was like 
2 or 1.3 million years ago. Uh, Pyranthropus boisei, which is not really human, Pyranthropus means it's kind of like an ape, uh, had this huge sagittal crest, a big crest of bone in the middle of his head, uh, because it, the chewing muscles are so big and strong, as they got bigger and bigger and stronger, they needed a place to anchor, because once they got to the top, there's no place to go, so they have this crest, because they ate very, very heavy food. Um, and what it was, um, Lucy, which was Australopithecus, Australopithecus afarensis, was not found here. Lucy was found in Ethiopia, but it's kind of like the same kind of thing. Lucy, I think, was 3.2 million years old. Uh, and there was one, oh, and humans, modern humans, Homo sapiens, had been there for 17,000 years. They found evidence of that. That's your archaeological <laughs> lesson for the day. Here we are at the Tarangiri Safari Lodge. These were the, quote, tents. Now, they are tents, but the tents are on, on a concrete platform, and the back is concrete also, where the, the shower and toilet sink and stuff were. And then they covered the whole thing with the thatch roof. But you can see there's not much else around. So here's looking in the other, other direction. There's a baobab tree right here, and maybe 100 feet past that was the, uh, the lounge area, the restaurant, and uh, the offices. And this is looking right out from the, from the tent. So you can see you're kind of out in the middle of not much. And this is the warning. It's another place, because it's open to the animals, you have to get the guide with a flashlight. And here are some elephants right behind our tent. They just came in. They were eating stuff. In fact, uh, a couple of elephants were being watered. They, they took a hose from the pool, and they were <laughs> watering the elephants. The elephants were drinking from the hose. OK, that's cool. This is the lounge, which I, I just found this place fascinating. OK, I have a little background in architecture, so I like the way it was, was built. But also, it's completely open. There are no windows, and there are no doors. Um, this, this is just a low wall here with the, the pillars. And off to the left, where the reception booth was, there's just an, an entrance. The entrance is probably 12 feet wide. Why don't the lions walk in there? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Anything could be there. I, I don't know how this works. I really am still perplexed. Anyway, so it was great. In front of the, that lounge is a, this um, terrace. In fact, they were working on they were retiling it. So this guy was building up. He was finishing that. In fact, I think he got it all done while we were there. And then off the terrace, you can look down to the river. You can see the elephants and other animals. And you can hear them, especially the, the uh, uh, zebras make a lot of noise. At night, the first night we went to bed, we heard at least three lions roaring, like 150, 200 feet away. It's hard to tell. And we know it was at least three because they'd all be like roaring at the same time. And like in bed like this, like, <laughs> I hope they don't know we're here. So it was, it was a, let me say, it was an interesting experience. The second night, like, there are the lions again. And by the third night, it's like, there are the stupid lions again. <laughs> it's amazing how fast you can get accustomed to this. Like, we got lions roaring outside the tent. We're going, oh, stupid lions again. They told us none of the animals would come in the tent. The only animal that might was the elephant. If you had food in the tent, they weren't after you. They wanted, if you had a banana, whew, you know, tear the tent down. Get, so they said, no food in the tent. OK, you, know, you don't have to tell me twice. Now, one morning, we gave our, our guide a little time off. I said, we're going to take what they call a bush walk. So um, this, this kid in the middle. He's the son of the owner, and the other guy, we didn't get his name, uh, he works for them, loaded up their rifles, and we went for a bushwalk down the hill and over by the river and stuff. I was like, okay, okay. And he said, um, at this time of year, they can do these bushwalks, but other times when the grass is high, they can't, because you don't know what's around. You might have the rifle. But uh, if you can't like, aim it quickly enough, you're in trouble. So 
Uh, we were lucky. He, he was going down there. Now, the, the, the black guy in the, in the army outfit here, he was behind us. He was doing sweep. And I kept looking around to see what he was doing. He was walking around like this. <laughs> and thought, come on, you know. <laughs> you know I don't know how they get it. I don't know. It's, it's just interesting. The, the guy in front was looking around because he wanted to show his stuff. And the guy in the back just wasn't paying attention. I thought, well, maybe if he's in the back, they'll get him first. <laughs> Here's an elephant rub. Elephants get in the river and they get in the mud on them and everything and they might have an itch on their side. They rub up against the tree and they wear the tree kind of smooth. Just to show you what they do. Here's one scratching his chin. And it's interesting, the next picture is going to be at the same place, but it's a different elephant, it was two days later. He's scratching his other side. I know it's the same place because I, I matched up the, the rocks that are in the river. So, you know, elephants have itches too. Here are some elephant tracks. See the little flat things, all right? That shouldn't be a surprise. There's an elephant jaw. Now, elephants get six sets of teeth. When one wears out, another one comes in, that, you know, keeps going on, they get six. When they are done with the sixth one, they can't eat anymore, you starve to death. Um, hard way to go, but you know, as you get that old, you get tired, and it's like, I'm ready to go anyway. So, uh, elephants in zoos can live longer, their teeth last longer, because they don't have food that's as rough. They get fed like hay that's been cut in a field instead of you know, all the dirt and everything that's in the, uh, the grass that the uh, wild elephants tear up. Some lion tracks. Mm -hmm. And a uh, cheetah. We did get to see, we uh, saw actually four cheetahs. One was just way, way off a couple days before this. Now this one uh, was apparently the mother and two daughters. Uh, the females will stick together like that. Usually the males get kicked out and have to go get their own food. So we saw the three of them there. Beautiful animal. I love them. The, the baby cheetahs or the kittens are really cute. They have this scruffy neck. You know, his hair sticks up on their neck. It's just the cutest things. There she is. Now, you know, they, they can hide just by sitting in plain sight with the way their, their markings are. If, if I didn't zoom in on this, you might not even see that she was there. And then we stopped for lunch. No fences, no knives, no, no, no guns, not even a flashlight. <laughs> Nobody was concerned. I, I, I was reading recently that in, in Yellowstone, they found that the elk, deer, will act differently like around a parking lot or uh, other place where a lot of tourists are. Because the, they found out over the years, I don't know how long it takes a, an elk to realize this, but the, the uh, deer, I mean the, the, the bears and the um, wolves don't like to be around people. So the elk know that if people are around, they're probably pretty safe. And their, their attitude, just the way they act, changes around people. Interesting. So we were with uh, Jimmy, or Naushad was his real name, uh, and I guess he knew that we weren't going to have any trouble. And while we were there, a herd of elephants walked by. That's another infrared shot. This was the place where we saw five herds at one time. They were all maybe eight, 10, 12 elephants in a herd. And so like a quarter mile after leaving this picnic spot with no fence, we found this lioness. And she was very intent on something was going on in this bush. And we watched her and watched her. And all of a sudden, she took off. It was a little bit blurry because she was moving fast. And she ran over to this bush, and there was nothing there. Nothing. And we were trying to see what was in there. I don't know what it was. And then, then she kind of looked around like, hope nobody saw that. <laughs> this is, uh, OK, Lake Manyara, you can read that. But this is the same layout, same floor plan as those hoppet houses that we had earlier on. Same round format. So inside, that's, that's what it looks like. You can see the, um, 
Got the mosquito netting here. And I just like the way they, they do the, the uh, fabrics and everything. It's a very African style. And a lot of rounded uh, corners and things. See how this is. Very interesting. You, you, don't, you don't tend to see that around here. Uh, we're in, I'm not sure if it's Lake Manyara or Tarangiri now, but um, a blue monkey. They just call them blue monkeys. And there's a good reason for that. Because they're blue monkeys. And here's one. Two things are interesting about this. One, he's not holding on the tree like this. He's holding on this way. And he's eating sap that's, that's trickling out of the tree. Okay, it's this sweet sap, so that's, he's getting a little bit of a, a snack there. Here are the rock hyraxes. Interesting little animals. Kind of look like guinea pigs. Anybody want to take a guess at what their closest li living relative is? The elephant. <laughs> Actually, elephants and manatees. Can't tell that from looking at them. Uh, you, know, you know, you have to be a, a scientist to look at how the bones are structured and see what the fossil record says and things like that. But so they're the closest relatives are elephants and sirenia, which are uh, manatees and dugongs, sea cows. And here's what their feet look like. They've got these toenails. They're not claws or anything, but they can run up and down trees just fine. In fact, this is the animal I told you was living in over that the uh, restaurant in the, in the Serengeti. And they would just climb up the tree and jump over and uh, like squirrels. Lovebird, saw a few of them around. They were hard to get a good picture of. Wouldn't come close. And uh, there are several kinds of hornbills that live there. This is a ground hornbill, as you can see. There's the silver-cheeked hornbill eating something and red-billed hornbill. Lapid-faced vulture. They have several kinds of vultures that live there. Vultures are very important um, for the ecosystem. They clean up um, all the decaying matter, make it a, a cleaner place to live, quite frankly. Here's the vulture condo. As the sun is starting to set, they're getting ready for the evening. These are called silhouette condo, uh, silhouette vultures. I just made that up because they're silhouettes. And the sun is setting slowly, maybe not so slowly in the west. Here are a couple of wildebeest jousting. I like the way the, the dust is kicking up and lights up in the, in the sun. There the sun going below a, uh, an acacia. And as the so sun sinks quickly in the west, we say farewell to Tanzania, but the trip isn't over yet. The highlight of the trip home. Fish pedicure. Here's what it looks like. It tickles a little bit. Does it really do you any good? I don't know, but when you've got nothing better to do in Amsterdam airport, you've had all the coffee you could stand, that's what you get. The end. Thank you. Questions? I hope I have the answers. The temperature during the day. Temperature, yes, a good question. Um, in the daytime, it was probably in the 70s. Um, it, and it depended where we were when we were at uh, the crater, Tarangiri, uh, not Tar uh, Nagoro Nagoro Crater. The, the rim is, I think, 7,000 feet. Is that right, George? Remember that? Was it 7,000 feet? It was, it was chilly there at night. Um, in fact, yeah. yeah, it was October. You know, of course, this is the southern hemisphere, so the seasons are different, but it was like only two to a half degrees south of the equator, so you know, it's not going to get really hot or really cold. It's going to really depend on the altitude. So it was, it was chill. I bet it was maybe low 40s at night. Um, and that was the place where we, I said we were kind of like imprisoned. So to get from the, the room to the, the dining area, Basically, you go out of the room. The, the hallways are all open, uh, so all the lions can come in. You know? <laughs> so, uh, so 
we would make a, a beeline because it was, it was really pretty chilly. You know, we didn't bring heavy clothes. We had, you know, maybe one fleece or something like that, but it was pretty chilly at night. Um, the other places it wasn't that chilly at night. We, we never needed air conditioning by any means. Uh, it was cool enough at night that uh, we, were, we were happy. And you also don't want to leave the windows open, right? <laughs> it's like, oh, who's going to come in next? Uh, and at the uh, Tarangiri, where we were in the tents, it was, it was comfortable at night. It was, it was cool-ish. It's hard to say what the temperature was. We were fine. We didn't really pay a lot of attention to the temperature because it, it just was comfortable. Yes? Did you see any snakes? No. No, um, didn't see any snakes. Um, wish I had. Some people might not agree with me, but it would have been fun to see some snakes. Uh, huh? Oh, we did. We see. We did see a, a boa in the in the tree. That's right. It was, it that was like a not so good situation. Couldn't see it well. Kathy and I jumped out of the vehicle to go over and take a picture out of it. No, oh, get back in the vehicle. <laughs> so we didn't get a picture. Jump back in the vehicle. <laughs> the guy didn't say a word to us. I'm like, all right. I'm glad I got through this one alive. Uh, but you know, we we had just left that that um, picnic spot where. There was nothing around, you know, it was not a problem. So we thought, well, it's okay to hop out here, but maybe it wasn't such a good idea. Question? Um, how would the leopard get huge herbivore up in the tree? How did it get the, it's, uh, it's prey up in the tree? Yeah. They drag it up, they're very, very strong. They grab it in the mouth and just they climb the tree. Very, very strong animals. In fact, uh, chimpanzees are supposed to be something like six times as strong as a man. And a, a male chimp gets to be something like 150 pounds. So, yeah, the animals, you know, we're kind of wishy-washy when you think about it, what goes on in the animal world, you know. If we can type fast enough, we can make a living, you know, but they have to go out and catch food. First uh, few minutes, we might have already talked about what kind of food do they have? Like a lot of sweet potatoes? Or... Oh, I ate a lot of Indian food. Because they have people coming from all over the world, and I try to be vegetarian. So if you're going Indian, it's easy to be vegetarian. Uh, but they would have, yeah, I'm not sure. They would always have salad bars and stuff like that. It was, it was, it was a pretty wide variety of food you can get. Yeah, uh, Sue could tell you a lot more. She's a, more of a foodie than I am. You know, I know I had food. That's about all I know. <laughs> oh, George, no, George never eats anything. George, uh, yeah, the poor guy. He runs marathons. He burns up like 12,000 calories a day, and he eats cupcakes like one after another. Um, we, we did have two very exciting um, times there. I, I had a birthday while I was there, and the people in the lodge sang happy birthday to me in Swahili which is pretty cool. And George and Kathy celebrated their 25th wedding anniversary while we were there. So it was, it was a, you know, pretty cool. A, a trip to remember. Yeah. Yeah. No trouble with visas or getting into the country? No. No, it's pretty simple. Um, the scary part is you have to mail your, your passport down to Washington, D.C., to the Tanzanian embassy. Mm -hmm. and it's like, oh. yeah, I'm, I'm careful with that, just as I am with my social security number. And I, you know, to mail this thing off <laughs> is a little bit scary. But, um, oh, that's another thing. By the way, we all say Tanzania. They all say Tanzania. Oh, Tanzania. Yeah. Yes. Does the Tanzanian yellow come from there? Isn't that an animal? Oh, um, no. That's um, Tasmanian devil. Tas that's from, from like the Tasman Sea, the, um, you know, New Zealand, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, the only, no, we didn't see any devils when we were there. Did you have inoculations for yellow fever? Yes, we did. Um, we had, had some shots. Can you repeat the question? Oh, I'm sorry, yes. Uh, did we have inoculations? And yes, we did. Um, I've, we've done a lot of traveling over the years, and a lot of things were already done. Uh, but we did have to take malaria medicine with us, uh, malarone, and my bride got deathly sick from the malarone, very, very sick from it. And... Uh, you know, you don't know if it's something you ate, you know, because 
here there. I always say, you know, avoid salads because lettuce and things, they have all these little nooks and crannies and all kinds of little bugs can live in there. So I didn't bother having any salads when I was there. I had just food I knew was cooked and everything. Um, but she got really sick and we traced it back to the Malarone medicine. Were there inexpensive gem shopping? Um, I don't know. Uh, I'm not a gemologist by any means, uh, and I'm not a shopper by any means. Um, I, I came, we came back, I had a t-shirt that they gave me for my birthday. Uh, oh, no, 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 that was because we stayed at one place four nights, so they gave, <laughs> gave us t-shirts. Yeah, so I got it, in fact, it's right here. This, this, oh, sorry, forget about wearing microphones. Um, and they gave George a t-shirt, but it says Kenya. <laughs> and uh, they gave the ladies, they gave uh, shukas, shuka. Uh, shuka, the, the, uh, the cloth that the Maasai people wear, and Kathy took Sue's shuka and made pillows for us, for our, our cat, so it was, it was great. Um, I don't know what she did with hers, wash the car or something, I don't know what. <laughs> uh, yep, one more. Um, add to the, the tsetse flies, what kind of diseases did they cure? Oh, tsetse flies carry uh, sleeping sickness. Um, trypanosomiasis, is that right? That's the easy word to remember. I can never, can never remember sleeping sickness. Um, yeah, sleeping sickness, uh, it can be treated, but if it's not treated, it, it can and, and probably will be fatal. It's a, apparently not a nice way to... Sorry? I, I don't know if there's one. I, I don't know if there's one for it, but you know, they tell you, you know, use bug spray and stuff like that. And certainly if you get a bite, report it and you can take some medicine. And I don't know if there's a, I don't know if there's a shot for it. Oh, and apparently, oh, well, that's malaria. But um, yeah, sleeping sickness, uh, I've seen some photos of people that had sleeping sickness and you really don't want it, believe me. Uh, malaria is the other thing. We were concerned about malaria and Almost no mosquitoes where we were. Um, I mean, if we saw one, it was a lot. Of course, you know, we're slathered down with bug spray and everything. And we want to avoid malaria. So we're chatting with the, uh, the guide. Oh, you ever had malaria? Oh, yeah, three or four times. Oh, OK. And then this kid that took us on the bush walk. So have you had malaria? Oh, yeah, three or four times. Like, it's not a big deal to them. You know, we think it's like the end of the world. But you know, you get sick, you get better. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Because they don't have their is not. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Did you drink the water there? Did you have to drink bottled water? We're very careful with the water. And if you're the places where we were, you could drink the water. I tended not to. Um, stuck to beer. <laughs> no, just kidding. Uh, when we were out in the vehicles, we had plenty, plenty of bottled water. And we'd always make sure we drank that bottled water and keep one or two in the, in the room. In fact, they, I think they did supply one or two bottles of bottled water. So I did that. I never drank anything out of the tap. So it, it's, it's just not worth taking the chance. So. And I'm not a skittish person. You know, I'm not really concerned, but you know, why be silly about it? Okay. Yes. What's people's main occupation? Well, the Maasai people are, are herders and shepherds. Uh, the other people, we have a lot of people that are in service, like in the hotels. Uh, and back in the city, I'm sure that people do everything that other people in cities do. And I don't think this, you know, it's unusual. We have shopkeepers and gas stations and drugstores and things like that. Um, I have a question. What were the people like? People were wonderful. People are really wonderful. You know, if you're in a hotel or something, you know that people are supposed to be nice to you. But there's a, there's a being nice and there's a genuine nice. And these people are genuinely nice. You can just see it in their eyes. And the little kids were wonderful. You'd like to scoop them up and take them home. They'd, they'd see you driving by and they'd be waving and smiling and cheering. And it's just, it was just great to see them. Okay. Thank you very much.